Thanks, Brennan and the Red Center for hosting this event. My paper is Decision Making in the Desert, Choosing to Continue at Dance Hall Rock, a Case Study. At the quarterly conference at the Old Rock Church, December 1879, the clerk carefully read out the names of those who would be called. These, these called are from many different countries of origin and had many different skill sets. Later, people would call them zealots, uncompromising, fanatical, but Bishop Arthur said, use your agency whether to go or not. But if you do go, go with a cheerful heart. Thus we see the formation of a new intentional community on the banks of the San Juan River, one of the most isolated places in the continental United States. But this was not new. Len Leonard Arrington, the economist, talked about the formulaic way that the Mormons colonized the West. They started with the preliminary explore exploratory party, fully equipped by the church. Then a group was appointed to go to the new settlement. The new community was expected to follow a pattern of creating civil and church institutions. And these community plans were not a, a spontaneous or independent. And just during the period of 1776 to 79, over 120 were formed. So what made this so different? Well, if they hadn't been successful, Utah wouldn't look like this. They'd lost their four corners. And secondly, is this rock monolith. This is their standstone temple to un uncompromising courage. My first experience in visiting the hole in the rock notch was when I was under age 10. Thank you, Lamont, for marking the trail. Just got back from Bluff. The death, desert scape is deceptive. It's so easy to underestimate distances. There's blind gulches, box canyons. And as I traveled down the road in the 55 Ford truck, my grandpa Hobbs had taken us and all the cousins in the back because it was the understanding that because of Lake Powell, the whole the rock would be all covered up. So he took us there to show us that last time. I remember the day going down to the Colorado River, skinny dipping in our skivvies. We were lucky. Another group that came down was deceived by the landscape, left their bus, got in the back of a cattle truck, and this Boy Scout group lost 13 people who died and 26 who were injured on the way to there finding the river. So as I looked down that notch as a little boy, I said, well, how did they do it? But as you get older, I began to question, why did they do it? How could they do it as a team? As a business owner, I took a very interesting class in the art of critical decision-making. And I thought, can we apply the science developed in the School of Management to the process of Mormon settlement in the building of these four, the Four Corners area? And how did leaders make difficult decisions and motivate their followers to fully cooperate and do extraordinary things? So this paper explores in a case study of this critical decision-making process. Harvard uses case studies to teach methodology, particularly in decision-making for good decisions as well as bad. David E. Miller, the historian really of the hole in the rock, our key person of, of the study, made this, this uh, uh, statement. This expedition is an excellent case study of the highest type of pioneering endeavor that broke the wilderness. So who would lead this study, this expedition? Silas so Stanford Smith, Smith, a missionary explorer, well-seasoned, had built 35 homes for his family. He established Fort Stanford in Panguish during the Black Hawk War, has connections there, connections in the, in the state or the territorial government as a probate judge, was also president of the United Order of Enoch in Paraguna, cousin of Joseph Smith Jr. He takes an exploratory party, April, 1879. They leave for Montezuma, go through Lee's Ferry, and as Lamont has talked about, uh, going around, digging wells for the Indians to try to pacify their intrusion into their lands. They leave two white women and their families and children at Montezuma. 
August, they leave, head back in late September. On the way, he had connected with his friends in Panguage. But almost immediately, they're turning around and starting the main expedition. Let's put a little historical context in this. The initial state of Deseret was planned to be a huge state, bordering on the lands that the Mormon Battalion established from United, for the United States from Mexico. Those initial efforts to expand came from Salt Lake City area, this is the place, which happened to be a border, a buffer zone between the Shoshone and, and, Shosh and Ute tribes, fortunately. Going north, the, the Mormons purchased the Miles Goodyear cabin. Going south, they were invited by Chief Wakara to go to the top, of, close to the top of the Spanish trail, the old Spanish trail called Manti, and also the borders of the Lesser Salt Lake and established Parowan. After a period of time, there was a contraction during the Utah War, Buchanan's blunder, as, Joseph, as Brigham Young brought all of the saints back to the, to, away from Salt Lake City and into the Wasatch Front. After a period of expansion, there was another period of extraction during the Black Hawk War, and particularly of interest, the abandonment of Panguage. 75 more Mormon settlers were killed, Black Hawk Raiders drove off, 10,000 head of cattle per John Wesley Cow. When that <clears throat> began to calm down, let's talk about the historical context of, of our journey in the 1870s. Leonard Arrington said the prime economic problem in Mormon country in the late 1870s was overpopulation. The flow of immigration and the natural increase in population had filled up the land. Our young people, as they marry, have no place to settle near their homes. Resources of the people are exhausted unless they go into manufacturing. And manufacturing was not the Mormon ideal, as David Carpenter will suggest. So this, this led to this second new wave of settlements going well into Snowflake, Gila Valley, uh, in Arizona, and the San Juan Mission. To understand the importance of the agriculture idea, Joseph Smith's Jeff idea of Zion was a Jeffersonian ideal that only through uh, like a yeoman farmer, could they cultivate the moral character and develop a fully responsible person. And farmers need land to survive. As Brigham Young would say, you know, my soul sings, feels hallelujah that he planted us in this place. This is the place to make saints. And as for gold and silver, let others have it. We will cultivate the soil. Brethren, plow your land. So one of those farmers was Platt D. Lyman, named because he was born on the Platte River during the Mormon Exodus to apostle and the member of the First Presidency of Mastus Lyman, and Eliza Partridge, the daughter of the first Bishop of Zion, and a plural wife of Joseph Smith. His father lost his apostleship in 1867 when he embraced with most of the world a spiritualism movement, and he became president of the Gadabite Church. So Platt has something to prove. He requests to Salt Lake to be a part of this expedition. He receives a letter back by the 12th, August 29th, late in that year, and suggests that the Partridge Group, again, not the Lyman Group, the Partridge Group, go and participate. So he sells his, his home for $100, a span of mules with his three brothers and two sisters. He's off to be the second in command. And as we talk about the problems in Mormon country, the baby boom, uh, the demographics of the, co of the company sort of illustrates that. As mentioned before, n the number of children under 567. But I'd like to maybe emphasize that there was a number of bachelors, 18 to 30, 41 of those. And those individuals would be provide the muscle for this journey. These bachelors would be integrated into the different company families. One of those brash ba bachelors was George Brigham Hobbs. He was part of the exploratory group, and he had left his sister with four young children in San Juan and promised to return. Born in England, walked across the plains, excited and young. One last point, Brigham Young's unfinished business. In, 18, in the late uh, 1874, after the panic of 1873, Brigham Young felt that it was time to, to finish what he had 
promised in his mind to do for Joseph Smith, and that is to recreate the United Order of, of Enoch. So he goes through with an energetic way and creates over 150 United Orders. Of note, many of the leaders of this particular mission have strong connections or leadership roles. And this might explain in, in Bob's talk about the co-op of why being cooperative was such an important part of the religious fervor of the early settlers of the San Juan. So what had happened is some of Silas Smith's friends had talked about a shortcut to go through their village of Escalante and directly across over to Bluff. So by the time Silas Smith had caught up with his main prodigy just in November, remember he's just come back in end of September, he found that the group was in a very difficult situation. Hemmed in by the Kaparowitz Plateau on one side and the Escalante River, the, the terrain funnels you to one spot to go down the river, a notch they called the hole in the rock. Snows had come early. A company of young women and children were marooned on the high desert. Samuel Rowley explained the situation plainly. Before we left our homes, we were told that the country had been explored and the road was feasible. Now we found someone had been mistaken. A spirit of gloom spread through the whole camp. Had they been led to impassable country? Would they have to turn back in failure? These commands, these questions demanded immediately answered. David Miller. There's no road beyond here in the country ahead is totally unexplored, which is the roughest white man has ever undertook to pass, Flat D. Lyman. That feeling became this by Sarah Smith, Sarah Williams. The unity among the people coming out with no conveniences, yet they were as happy as they could be. How did that change occur? Let's go and explore again the San Juan mission as a CAPE study. Principle one, cognitive bias. In the decision-making process, uh, it, it shows the demonstration of our human limitations, what's called a confirmation bias. Human beings are systematically overconfident in our judgments and something called the sunk cost effect, a tendency to escalate commitment over a failing course of action. In this case, Latter-day Saints are classic confirmation bias individuals, having a belief that the accessibility of deity that God does answer prayers and that a way will be made to overcome any difficulty is part of the theology of the Latter-day Saints. As far as the sunk cost effect, enormous costs have already been given. Leaving family, the social connections, the loss and selling of all, all your material goods, as well as being halfway there, a high cost in the sunk cost effect will be driving a force to move forward. As Jen Nelson, spiritual leader, says, it is a voice of the Lord for me to go forth, and I'm going forth by the help of the Almighty. The Lord will have a tried people. And of course, Jen is discussed in many, many talks, any talk about, about the settlement, called Kokjiji by the, the Navajo because of his crooked feet, born in Denmark, Braces Mormonism, immigrates to Zion as part of the ill-fated Willie Handcart Company, loses his first son there, settles in Parowan, is called to be the first Bishop of Panguage, this Panguage connection. is part of that new committee, the new community almost stars and saved by the famous quilt walk that they celebrate even today. Jens is acquainted with survival. He goes back to, has to leave Panguage because of the Black Harp War, back in Cedar City, volunteers to follow his oldest son when he's called to the San Juan Valley. He becomes a Bishop of Bluff for 25 years. Principle number two, deciding how to decide. There has to be a procedural legitimacy and the perception that making the decisions will be according to a general accepted norms and beliefs. That means in the Latter-day Saints, something called a theodemocratic process. And consensus needs to be confirmed by a, a final vote before go forward and back. In other words, all those in favor, please make it manifest. This theodemocratic policy was, uh, was a very important principle in the settling of the Intermountain West. And it was envisioned as a unifying force that would minimize faction. It would include basic liberties for all people and the voice of all. 
Jen Nelson. I move that the final decision be left to the president and the Lord. Platt alignment. It was resolved unanimously to sustain Brother Smith in whatever course he thought best for us to pursue. Principle three, deferment of judgment. A process of early phase of decision-making is to gather data without fear of judgment or criticism. Something called an anchoring bias, allowing an initial reference point will distort our own estimates. There was a strong anchoring bias with those who had gone before Silas Smith arrived had come back with tremendously negative reports. And sense-making, the cognitive process where groups interpret ambiguous situations and currently unanswerable questions. There were plenty of challenges, as Lamont has, has talked about. And just quickly to go over those, the 90 miles yet to be explored, the river crossing, the ability to go across the river, would money be appropriated? Would they be marooned and have no supplies or food? Fourth principle, avoid groupthink, that powerful social pressure to conform and, and conformity. So that to, re to reduce it, you need to draw out all points of view within a group. And during the process, make sure all the participants are listened to so the pr process is considered both fair and equitable. So Silas Smith sends 12 men ahead under the direction of Platt Dean Wyman to investigate this ambiguous threat. It was interesting because he didn't go forward. This would reduce his bias and would encourage discussion with the men to him directly. Platt D. Lyman drove back to camp in the rain. In the evening, an informal meeting was held by Brother Smith's tent when those who had been out reported the results of their explorations. Kuman Joan remembered several meetings were called by men at the head. And finally, an unanimous decision was made. So of those men who came forth, the majority felt like they couldn't go through this way. Kuman Jones mentioned, after one week of tramping about, the boys returned and gave their reports. About as many kind of reports as men. Some reported that they'd be out of the question for a company to attempt to get through this route. Some of those in this group, Samuel Rowley, even though we don't know his, his comments, had seven children at the age of 13. Cornelius Decker and part of the large Decker group said, before we left our homes, we were told the lamb had been explored. And particularly Platt D. Lyman. The country here is almost entirely solid sand rock, high hills, cut all into pieces by gulches, altogether impassable. It is certainly the worst country I ever saw. Most of us are satisfied that there's no use of this country un undertaking to get through to the San Juan this way. Of course, Platt's line group, his group of six wagons, <clears throat> almost 200 head of livestock. He's constantly searching for, for grass just to keep his animals alive. But this happened. At the meeting, Brother George Hobbs was induced by President Silas Smith to make a minority report. This he did reluctantly, as he did not desire to place himself in arbitrary opposition to the judgment of the rest of the brethren. But being urged to express his opinion, he thought it was possible to build a road through the broken country. This seemed to change the sentiment of the whole camp. Andrew Jensen. So who advocated the minority report? Mostly the <clears throat> early explorers from, who, had, who had gone ahead from Escalante. Andrew Scow, 38, come down from Panguage again to this lower place called Potato Valley. Three years just before, they ran into the surveyors of John Wesley Powell. They suggested they name the place Escalante. That's where the name came from. He's going to travel hundreds of miles, not only to explore, but to go back and tell and report. His counselor, Ruben Colette, a one-armed lawman, uh, he companions him somehow going down those cliffs with one arm. His flour mill and his, his molasses will help feed the mission. So his buy-in is very important. And again, George Hobbs from Parowan. And just remember, he had left his sister and promised to return to leave him food. During his process, he would leave many etchings in the stone to show where he had come. Principle five, decision-making consensus is a combination of commitment and shared understanding. And the individual groups need to be committed to cooperation in the implementation. And this requires consensus affirmation and team building after decisions made and how to frame, uh, frame uh, challenges as opportunities, frames or mental mo models that we use to simplify our understanding. 
So <clears throat> after meeting with the men who had gone ahead on Wednesday, he said, we thought we ought to go ahead. And all the ex those present expressed their willingness to spend the three or four months, which was very accurate, if necessary, to get the road to go through, as it was almost impossible to go back because of the scarcity of grass. Then he called a general meeting, the regular church meeting on Thursday night. The whole camp came and expressed their feelings in order that brothers Scow and Colette might let those who are coming to know what to go ahead. Again, it was un then unanimously appointed and voted on to approve and go forward with the road work. We must go on whether we can or not, Jen Nelson. <clears throat> he frames this event as a, as a religious crusade and Colette and, and Scow. If the rest of the backbone had as much, the rest of the company had as much backbone as Elder Hobbs, the company would undoubtedly get through. And this is a framing of the show of the muscular Christian faith, which was possibly directed at the young bachelors to get together and start to work. Cumin Jones, here lies the decision that would forever affect the outcome of the mission. So how were the ambiguous th threats addressed? 90 miles that had yet been explored. Silas Smith calls his close friends from Panguage, George Washington Seavey, Lemuel Red, to go forth with young George Hobbs and George Merrill. And they do succeed in going ahead and after 23 days come back with the, with the route. George Washington Seavey, at the time 47, very interesting individual come across to the gold rush in the 49ers as a 49er, left for ill by his friends in Salt Lake City, became involved with the Mormons. Uh, of note, he was part of the rescue party that helped the Willie Hancock Company be, be rescued on the high plains there, possibly running into Jens Nelson. He was the president of the, the United Order in Panguage and a friend of Silas. He and his bed, bed partner would be Lemuel Red. Lemuel Red is from North Carolina. Out of note, he had transferred George Seavey's mom from the Mississippi all the way to Panguage to let her die in, in his household. Uh, he's also going to die with his bedfellow friend in Colonial Juarez and, of course, established that ranch in Manassas. So as the explorers go out, just one point, um, they, ha they have eight di days of food and they run out here and just going and traveling to this area called Salvation Knoll, the only place uh, just past the uh, Elk Mountains, you can actually see the Blue Mountains and Hobbs, the only person had gone before after all this discouragement <clears throat> and pressure on him as a young man, located the Blue Mountains and after three days of hunger, were able to return and establish our this route. Ambiguous threat number two, the ferry crossing. Would Charles Hall be have the lumber and be successful in, in making a ferry? And again, he just had the, the skill set. Today, we worked all the wagons down the hole. 26 of them were ferried across the river. The boat is worked by one pair of oars, does very well. As they go down and across and pull the, the raft back up, back and forth. And the wagons go down January 26th, 1880. Charles Hall, of course, is he's from Maine. He's uh, builds this ferry and eventually ferries 83 wagons, established the ferry as a permanent settlement. As he's down there, he founds, finds a better place to go across, goes further up the river. And that place is still called Hall's Crossing today, ferrying across Lake Powell. The ambiguous threats, number three, money was tight. Could Silas Smith get the, the funds? <clears throat> Apparently Silas Smith ran into somebody because they immediately sent back 25 pounds of giant powder to, uh, and brother Smith, Silas ran into his brother who happened to be getting on the train to go to the territorial government. Remember the train went all the way to Richfield at the time. And so, it, of it, note of that 25 pounds, after four days receiving the powder, that's when the, the group went down. Saturday, a few days later, 31st, brother 
reported that the men from Panguage had brought down a thousand pounds of blast powder and had been left at 50 mile camp, Wyman White. <clears throat> so it takes 25 pounds to go down the hole, but there's another thousand pounds that needs to be used to go the rest of the way. And the bachelors get to work. I don't think I've ever seen a lot of men go to work with more will to do. We were all young men and the way we did make the dirt and rock fly was a caution. Coal the Cedar Boys were coal miners and the way they did make the rocks fly was a caution. The blasters and blowers from Wales, the Perkin brothers, Perkins brothers. And last ambiguous threat to food forage. As it went across the, the river, fortunately there was forage up Cottonwood Canyon. They just moved into new lands to keep their animals, their gas supply going, so to speak, in their cars. And uh, this interesting note, February 13th, busy the past three days, two men from Panguage come to the camp and they bring to help work and they bring 200 pounds of pork and 40 pounds of cheese. With that food, Hobbs loads up his burrows and heads to, to save his, his, the settlement and his sister. So in conclusion, Silas S. Smith, whether by inspiration, desperation, followed the principles of management that caused legitimate decision-making. This allowed for the commitment to task and co cooperation in the decisions implementation. <clears throat> now he ended up sick. So the one who was most uh, against it in a sense, or against it in some ways was Platt D. Lyman. And he executed on those decisions to go forward and addressed the many ambiguous threats and unknown challenges uh, and was an excellent leader for sharing his resources. As Joseph Smith taught, I teach people correct principles and they govern themselves. Now, it doesn't end as a nice note as David Carpenter is gonna mention. Uh, there are still gonna be many <laughs> uh, challenges in the future, but for this, because of this decision making process, this part of their journey seemed to have tremendous amounts of unity. And that unity goes on to today. The, the posterity of, of many of these pioneers helped uh, rejuvenate and, and re-set re, re, uh, re, uh, re up the fort of Bluff. Um, the friendships of <coughs> CV and, and Red um, go on. Um, they go to Manassas, run into Miles Romney of Mitt Romney Connection, and are, they pass away there after the Edmund Tackett Act drives them out of the United States. And of course, uh, the Red Ranch is still there, <coughs> making those great uh, high altitude bowls and funding this event still. Uh, the other person of note of, of Manassas is uh, Jack Dempsey. Uh, who was a Mormon when he was younger, became the most uh, prominent professional fighter and, and professional athlete in the Gilded Age. So let's end up. Is all this effort, is this a mere cultural oddity in the Intermountain West? Um, Mormons with their toothy grins and, and gullibility? Or what's the main contribution in the market paid of ideas that we could learn from these pioneer principles? Maybe it could be said it's the principles of leadership. It's the disruptive decision-making that occurs in today's world. This might be the true uh, benefit of all this pioneering uh, efforts. Just of interesting note, International Magazine was published just a few weeks ago that I think really was right on point. So I'd like to end with this. This is an overview of Mormon decision-making policy and leadership. And from the magazine, these quotes, quotes from the governor, the uh, Utah governorship. Win or lose in Utah, we work together. We have a history here of wanting to bring the other side to the table. So let's show the country that there is a better way. And continuing, Mormons centralized institution underpins their greater pragmatism and openness to diversity. It also promotes empathy over righteousness. Their past represents for Mormons a, a parable of existence as a sacred stu study, struggle, demanding humility and accommodation with a hospital world. And that really talks about this paper, right? They must worship in their local church. They are urged to support their poor neighbors. This explains why Utah might have the lowest wealth inequality of any state, um, almost like the Scandinavian countries. 
And one last quote. For literary critic Harold Bloom, Mormonism was the authentic version of the American religion, which yet may prove decisive for the nation. Something similar could be said for the prag pragmatic politics the churches endorses. It is a reminder to America of its more expansive and optimistic past. With effective decision-making, we can do hard things.